There were very few years growing up when I went to church on Holy Thursday or Maundy Thursday, which means mandate, because we are given a new mandate in John's Gospel, aren't we, to love one another. But we always sang one song that I have never been able to put in a bulletin since I was in seminary. Are ye able, said the Master, to be crucified with me? Yea, the sturdy dreamers answer, to the death we follow thee. Lord, we are able, our spirits are thine. Remold them, make us like thee divine. Thy guiding radiance above us shall be a beacon to God, to love and loyalty. I can still recite those words. I haven't sung that song since 1983 when I began seminary. Maybe you're wondering why I don't use that song. It's because I had the Dr. James C. Logan indoctrination class called Systematic Theology when I was at Wesley Seminary. What he said was true. How can we possibly sing those words? Lord, we are able. And if you, how many of you grew up singing that song, Are You Able, said the Master? That refrain is sort of like a drinking song. It said, Lord, we are able. We're not able, are we? We're not able at all. Which is what strikes me every time I read these words. Now, this evening, we're not talking about John. We're not going to do a foot washing. Because to be honest, before I get my knee surgery, I don't think if I got down to wash anyone's feet, I could ever get back up again. And with COVID, we've stayed apart from each other, so washing people's feet feels very intimate. Also, people don't like foot washing services because people say it's embarrassing. They don't want me to touch their feet because their feet are icky. People have said to me through the years, can we just do a hand washing instead? And I always say no, because that's too comfortable. There's something uncomfortable in this evening, isn't there? But tonight, we're not going to look at the foot washing. We're not going to read from John's Gospel other than what we read at the call to worship, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. He's coming to the end of his life, but I want us to focus tonight on this meal. Now, the words are a little different when you read the other Gospels, where the song really comes from, because Jesus does not say specifically, can you drink from the cup that I have to drink from? Which is where that we get that, are you able, said the master, to be crucified with thee? Lord, we are able. But they all say they're able, don't they, in this passage. They're all ready to go with him to the end. Simon, who is called Peter, says, no matter what, I will follow you to the end. Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan's going to sift you all like wheat. Before the cock crows, you're going to deny that you even know me. This is after Judas has already gotten in his heart to betray his Lord. We know that the rest will fall asleep. We know that they will run into the night when he's arrested. And yet, what does he do? But he feeds them. He knows what's ahead. They don't get it. Because he's just come into Jerusalem to triumph. People cheering and waving palm branches. I'm so sorry I didn't get to see you all waving your palm branches on Sunday. Shouting Hosanna to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The disciples were on a high, and here they are at Passover. Passover, the great triumph of God over the Egyptian warlords and overlords who had them in slavery for so many years. It's a celebration and a remembrance of God's redeeming love that brought them to freedom through the Red Sea. And then Jesus says what he says. Everything's going to go south tonight. And they don't like it, do they? Now they start arguing among themselves, saying, who could possibly betray him? And certainly it couldn't be me, could it? Because what's the next argument they have? Which one of us is the greatest? Not which one of us could possibly betray him, but which one of us is the greatest? This is right after James and John's mother had been sent to Jesus on their behalf, saying, when you come into your kingdom, could one of them sit at your right and one of them sit at your left? Because they do not understand his kingdom at all. And yet he feeds them. This is Luke's gospel tonight. Luke's Gospel, where just when he's nailed to the cross, the first words from his lips are, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Father, forgive me. I don't know what I'm doing half the time is what we should be praying every day of our lives. But we know what we're doing most of the time, don't we? And still we do it. Now, when I read these lessons weeks ago to prepare for tonight, trying to get the bulletin ready to give to Barry so he could do the PowerPoint, even though he couldn't be here to show it tonight. And Mike's doing all the jobs back there himself tonight. But when I read these lessons, and I've read them so many times before, 
It struck me how everyone was going to leave him. They were going to desert him, deny him, betray him, abandon him. And yet he feeds them. Every time I share communion, I remember this, that he feeds them no matter what they've done. He feeds me knowing what I've done, knowing how I have betrayed him with my words and my actions and the thoughts of my heart. And still I am fed when I come to his table. This is love. This is love. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. When I read the words this year, the phrase that came to my mind was, don't bite the hand that feeds you. So I had to come up with a sermon title very quickly. I never like titling sermons because you put it down and then you sort of have to go with it no matter what the scripture leads you and your prayer leads you as you get closer to the day. But I looked up the origin of the phrase. Does anybody here know where that phrase originated? Don't bite the hand that feeds you. 1915 in America. It was a song called Don't Be Biting the Hand That Feeds You. It was written toward immigrants as we were in World War I because the feeling against German immigrants especially was very hard and against any immigrants from Eastern Europe was very, very hard. People had a hard time getting a job. People had a hard time getting an apartment or a place to live, especially in the cities in the East. And the song was written about trying to keep people in line. Sort of a nasty way of saying it, wasn't it? Don't bite the hand that feeds you. It says, if you don't like your Uncle Sammy, then go back to where you came from. These are the words of this song. You can look it up on the internet. You can even listen to it. It's a real jaunty little tune about pushing people away. But Jesus draws us to himself. I would say don't bite the hand that feeds you. In this respect means don't break his heart. Don't break his heart. We do that unintentionally, but we do it sometimes in full knowledge of our actions. Just remember that whatever you do, whatever you've done, whatever mistakes you've made, either intentionally or without even thinking and knowing what you've done to hurt someone else, you are still being fed at the table. I told you so many times that I'm a sacramentalist. I believe that this is the presence and power of Jesus Christ with us tonight. Every time we share communion, we're sitting with him at the table at the Last Supper, never more so than on this evening. We're with each other here in this place, in the present time, with the people around the world who are celebrating tonight. You know, in the Ukraine, I know that they're celebrating Holy Communion because this is the night of remembrance. Now, the Orthodox folks have a different day, and they'll be celebrating it too. We're celebrating with the Baptists down the road and the Roman Catholic churches in our community, everyone else in between. We're celebrating with them the presence and power of our Lord Jesus Christ who saves us again and again, who forgives us over and over, who calls us to his table. So we're here together tonight. The people at home are with us tonight. But you know where else we are? We're at the table in the kingdom of heaven because that is the foretaste of what we will experience when we're all together again. So whoever you've lost in your life, picture them at the table with you tonight. They won't be drinking out of a little plastic cup because one day we're all going to share that same loaf and that same cup again. But what we are sharing tonight is the body and blood of our Savior. He gives himself to us in the cup that never runs dry in the bread of heaven. We're called to share and eat. We're called to try our best to turn in a new direction toward him and one another. What is it that he says? He's going to confer upon us a kingdom, knowing full well that we're going to do what we're going to do. We're going to go our own way and make our own mistakes. But still, he is willing to confer upon us a kingdom that where he is, we will be always. We're all sifted like wheat sometimes, aren't we? We're all tested and tried. Even if we fail, we're still loved. So when you, you're not coming forward tonight, but when you take that little wafer, a little bit of juice, know that this is the 
power and presence of your Lord with you this evening. Know without a doubt that you are loved. That you, nothing you've done or ever could hope to do could ever break God's love for you in Jesus Christ. And then be thankful and rise to new life. Amen. <laughs>